Good evening. It's time for Bottom Line Africa with me, Yusuf Ibrahim. It is 9 p.m. in Cairo, where 43 people have been sentenced to life in prison after a mass trial in Egypt that also saw years-long sentences given to hundreds of others. And the time is 10 p.m. right here in Nairobi, where the country's topmost judge has vowed to defend the sanctity of the beleaguered arm of government in the face of political turmoil over the Supreme Court decision to nullify the August presidential election. Our Trix Ngando is just back from Bujumbura and we'll be sharing our experience in covering the Secretive Burundi. Also, a very enlightening conversation on how the entertainment industry in the continent is changing lives. The discussion tonight, uh, Marek uh, Fox uh, from the Salty Soul Entertainment, musician Dan Koth and Kennedy Wodo from Churchill's Laugh Industry. But first, Africa, let's uh, look at Africa in 60 seconds. Now apart. We are prepared to pay the ultimate price. The Kenyan judiciary remains resolute amid pressure from the political class over its decision to annul the presidential results. Zimbabwean government has renamed the Harare airport after its long-serving president, Robert Mugabe. Authors and book lovers converge in Mogadishu for the first of its kind annual book fair in the volatile nation. And tonight, we'll explore the opportunities to make wealth out of Africa's emerging entertainment industry. Well, if you're just joining us, the program begins right now. And of course, this is Bottom Line Africa. On a Twitter poll tonight, we're asking you, do you think the entertainment industry has come off edge in Africa? Do you think the entertainment industry has come off edge in Africa? You know, the drill, drill our Twitter handle is at KTN News. You can as well tweet me at Yusuf Ibra. Remember to use the hashtag Bottom Line Africa. And of course, that question is going to form the basis of our discussion tonight. Now, Kenya's Chief Justice David Maraga has said that he and other members of the legal body which selects judges are prepared to pay the ultimate price to protect the constitution and the rule of law. Now, his strongly worded statement was made as Jubilee Party supporters stage protest outside the judiciary headquarters, blaming the Supreme Court for a denied win in the August 8th election. Earlier, a petition against two Supreme Court judges, Deputy Chief Justice Philomena Mwilu and Isaac Lenaola, linking them to improper contact with NASA lawyers during the duration of the presidential petition. The Chief Justice also blames the police boss for failing to offer security to the judiciary. If leaders are tired of having a strong and independent judiciary, they should call a referendum and abolish it altogether. Anything happens to the individual judges, staff, or their families, these making, those making these inciting statements will be held personally responsible. Over to Nigeria, at least 15 people were killed on Monday when suicide bombers attacked an aid distribution point in northeast Nigeria in the latest suspected strike by Boko Haram insurgents against civilians. Now, the blast occurred in the Konduga area, about 40 kilometers from the Bono state capital, Maiduguri, both of which have been repeatedly targeted by the jihadist group. On August 16th, at least 28 people were killed and more than 80 injured when three female suicide bombers detonated their explosives outside a camp for displaced persons in Konduga. Northeast Nigeria is in the grip of a humanitarian crisis caused by the Islamist a group Boko Haram insurgency, which has left at least 20,000 people dead and displaced more than 2.6 million people since 2009. The violence has devastated farming, led to chronic food shortages, and leaving hundreds of thousands of people on the brink of starvation and dependent on aid agencies for help. The says it was looking into allegations 
that complaints of sexual abuse and exploitation made against its peacekeepers in the conflict-torn Central African Republic were mishandled or unreported. The UN's 10,000-strong mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, has been dogged by accusations of sex abuse since it deployed in 2014 to cap fighting between mainly Muslim Seleka rebels who had ousted the president and Christian militias. Internal UN case files handed to Code Blue, a campaign by non-governmental organizations seeking greater accountability for UN troops, uh, detailed 14 initial fact-finding inquiries into complaints made against uh, MINUSCA peacekeepers uh, from nine nations. To address any allegations that come to light, whether through us or through the media or through, or through NGOs, um, you know, in line with the Secretary General's stated zero tolerance uh, policy on sexual exploitation abuse. Is it, is it, a, res is it a representative uh, sample or is this something that the UN is, is taking steps to, to address? We look into each and every case that is reported to us and follow on our established investigative protocols. Sometimes there is not enough evidence to pursue an investigation. If more evidence is presented in the future, the case is reopened. Now, flames engulfed Abidjan's Abobo market late Sunday night, devastating the area, although no deaths were reported. Goods and market stalls were extensively damaged in the inferno. It took firefighters several hours to control the fire. Police have opened an investigation into its cause. The Abobo market is known mainly for its food stalls. Traditional clothing, art and other goods are also sold there. Now, South African model Gabriela Angels has appeared in court to challenge Zimbabwean First Lady Grace Mugabe's diplomatic immunity, which allowed her to evade assault charges. Uh, now, Mugabe is alleged to have assaulted Angels with an electrical extension cable at the hotel where the Mugabe's two cents was tang. The Zimbabwean First Lady is alleged to have offered cash to make potential charges, quote-unquote, go away, according to the claimant's lawyer. Angels said she suffered deep cuts to her forehead and the back of her head and has opened a police case alleging assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. She appeared at a press conference wearing a large plaster on the left side of her forehead days after the alleged assault. I firmly believe that we have a very uh, capable team behind us and uh, we know it's going to be a big fight but uh, we're ready for the fight and we do believe that um, justice will prevail in this case. How can my daughter attack her with a knife and she's got so many body bodyguards with her? It's utter lies. Today we are not going to deal with the immunity as such. The only thing we are dealing with is a formal proceeding uh, in terms of which we get permission from the court to cite Grace Mugabe as a party. Uh, so we will not be asking uh, for, for set, setting aside of the, of the uh, immunity at this stage. Um, this is just a preliminary process. Well, and still connected uh, to that uh, story, Zimbabwe's uh, First Lady Grace Mugabe failed to appear at a summit in South Africa attended by her husband over the weekend. The wife of President Robert Mugabe has not been seen since being accused of attacking uh, that 20-year-old model with an electrical extension cord in Johannesburg Hotel, where the couple's two sons was tang. The matter also appears to have spilled into aviation. Police had said Grace Mugabe was expected at the two-day Southern African Development Community uh, meeting that opened with the fastest pauses program. The regional summit's closing ceremony on Sunday was also scheduled to include partners of the heads of state for its 15 member nations. In closing, the ECA offers its deep We pay tribute to our leaders that passed on recently and who fought for our collective freedom 
and contributed towards our region, region's liberation. We have achieved certain milestones. There's still a lot more work to be done. During our tenure of office, we are grateful that uh, SADC member states enabled us to vigorously promote industrial development, which is significant for the economic growth of our nation. Well, tonight it seems Zimbabwe is hitting the headlines left, right and centre. Now the Zimbabwean government says it has renamed the Harare International Airport to Robert Gabriel Mugabe International Airport in honour of the country's long-serving president. But the move has been condemned by opposition political parties who accuse him of ruining the economy. The government has also located $53 million to the refurbishment of the airport terminal, which was built 12 years ago. This comes amid frantic attempts by Mugabe's political allies to initiate massive legacy projects in his honour as he enters the twilight of his life. Born in 1924, he is the only leader Zimbabwe has known since independence in 1980. Last month, the government announced the approval of a plan to build a state-funded Robert Mugabe University, which will cost taxpayers a whopping $1 billion. Now, over to West Africa. West African navies took part in joint training with French forces in the Gulf of Guinea as part of efforts to boost security in the region's coast, spanning more than a dozen countries. This exercise had navy officers from Nigeria and Togo going through various possible crime scenarios at sea. The Gulf of Guinea has some of the world's most under-policed waters where maritime crimin criminals uh, smuggle drugs, hijack vessels, illegally fish and sell stolen oil from Nigeria. There were anti-piracy exercises with the Nigerian Navy and another with the Togolese Navy on illegal uh, fishing. Other exercises were also organized with the Marines of Ghana, Ivory Coast, as well as Senegal. The training comes ahead of a meeting of Navy chiefs in West Africa, Central Africa, and France uh, this week, aimed at bolstering a maritime community in the Gulf of Guinea to improve safety in the region. I believe that the level of exercise is not the most important aspect. The important thing is the cooperation framework in which we are carrying this exercise. It is about cooperation framework between the local Marines and the Marines that are operating in the Gulf of Guinea. Today we are working with the visiting teams. We have done our best for them to work in the same way as ours do. We have adopted the exercise in this regard. Now, negative perceptions and political instability could easily sabotage a country's efforts towards economic growth. In Burundi, efforts are being made to shed a persistent perception of violence and instability in order to attract investors and open up the country for business opportunities. Our reporter Trixin Gado met up with the Kenyan ambassador to Burundi, Kenneth Viticia, who painted a picture of the ease of doing business in East Africa's smallest country. Here's that report. Take a look between two countries. With us is Ambassador Ken Viticia who's going to give us an overview of inter-trade between Kenya and Burundi and what needs to be done before both countries are mutually beneficial to one another. Thank you very much for joining us, Bona Ambassador. Uh, thank you. Uh, what is trade like between these two countries? Are we doing everything we need to do to make it a, a, a benefit for us and uh, in Kenya and Burundi as, as a country? Uh, the centerpiece of Kenya's diplomacy in, is the regional diplomacy. As uh, President Uhuru is our number one diplomat, yes. and he has directed all of us to ensure that the region is central to the economic diplomacy. So trade with Burundi is very important for us. Kenya needs to sell to the region. Those youth you see waking up in the morning going to, my, uh, to industrial area, they go there because we are able to sell in the region. Right. So any ambassador that is posted within the Great Lakes region must ensure that Kenya sells in the region. Is Ken now, we have our very own Trixie Ngada right here with us in studio. She has just uh, come from Bujumbura, that is in Burundi. Trix, good evening and welcome to the program. So can you give us a rough picture on how your experience was like in Bujumbura? Because uh, the reports we're getting out of there that has been hitting mainly international media is that of violence. 
Yes, uh, Yusuf, the reports that we get out of that country are really dire. It seems like it's a, a mess that of a third world country. But my personal experience when I went there is that it's not as ugly as the international bodies p painted. And uh, the h biggest report lately is that UN report that says that the country is undergoing massive people being killed, extrajudicial killings, people disappearing, sexual offenses. So the country's ruling party, Sandidi, FDD, wanted to paint, uh, to give us a picture of something that is more positive. I have to say that the country has really heavy security. The military is heavy, deployment is all over, but still it's not a country where you hear grenades of gunfire and, and uh, being thrown uh, uh, left, right and center. It is a bit calm. And the most interesting things that you would see in that city that uh, of Bunjubura that you wouldn't expect is that it is a tourist-like city. You would actually compare it to Mombasa because of the weather, the climate and the resorts that are over there. And we have tourists all over the place, which is rather surprising because we know very little of Burundi and when you get in there you're really probably scared for your own security but it's a different city and and you know the people come out uh, came out on a Friday or Saturday to show that they do not agree with these reports that are being, being given out what you're seeing on the screen is that day the people came out to the streets in the thousands just to show that they do not agree with those reports they want a positive image coming out because they're trying to get themselves together we know that Burundi is not where most East African countries are economically and politically and they're str struggling to make it there so when these reports come out, they tend to pull them back, especially when it comes to doing business. Uh, investors want to feel easy or free to go to a country that is said to be killing people and having people disappearing and people are not free to just conduct their, their normal business in a free way. So um, uh, what I would say about Burundi as a country is really that it is a country that is a budding, a budding political a, a democracy. And another issue is that one of uh, Pierre Kurziza, the current president. He was in not implicated in that report. He it is said that the government officials, security agencies, and member of a youth faction of Sandy DFDD are the ones perpetrating these things that uh -huh. the current ruling party is emphatic in denying that these things did not happen. They did happen in 2015 after that disputed election, but they have moved on since then and things are progressing and they want this picture to be the same picture that is mm -hmm. pictured out to the rest of the world. Thank you, thank you Trix, for giving us a different picture of, of Burundi, but the fact remains that you know the country is still in a political turmoil. This after Nkurunziza, the current president, illegally decided to run for a third term in office. But let's talk about the investment opportunities the Kenyan ambassador to Burundi has been talking to you about. Yes. And it seems Kenya is getting a lot of competition from other from other countries? Oh, yes. He had a bone to pick with the, the local business heads and the organizations that are in charge of business uh, here and in the East African uh, region. He says that um, while Kenya enjoyed a lot of prosperity way back in the day, they are coming out emerging economies that are giving it a run for its money. But Kenya has not changed its way of operating because it's still riding on the glory of yesteryears. And he says that if we're not careful, countries such as Egypt that always have their marketing teams all over the region and promoting their products, countries such as Ethiopia, countries such as Rwanda, which is just catching up with Kenya and overtaking it, mm -hmm. might just give us a run for our money because they are uh, out there working while we are not really marketing ourselves out there because we feel that we still got it, If some people, as some people would say. Are there Kenyan biz businesses that you've managed to see in Bujubra during your stay? Uh, yes, there are Kenyan Kenyan business in that country. We have KB, K, K, KCB Bank. We have a lot of banks, but the difference is they have a lot of service-related uh, businesses rather than products. So we're not marketing our products as much as would be because, and Burundi actually, being that it is not as dire, as horrible, as violent as it seems, is actually a market that is waiting to be tapped, especially when it comes to products. So what is needed right now is that Kenyan people, investors, go out and invest in that country, especially when it comes to um, uh, products rather than services, because our service industry is really making strides in trying to make, it, make itself available to the Burundian market. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to products, we're not doing as well. But still, we know that that country really needs to do a lot of PR and make, give, a, a confident, uh, give confidence to investors, because we might say all these things, but is mm -hmm. it true? And can we make people confident? Because when it comes to business, ease of doing business, it's all about stability. And no one wants to put their money in a place where it is felt that it is not really conflict-free or positive or political, politically stable. So they still have a long way to go in ensuring mm -hmm. that people are confident in them.
thank you very much, Trix, for that comprehensive update. That was Trix Ngando, a reporter who just came from Bujumbura in Burundi. Now, before we cross over to South Africa and talk about rhino horns, let me once again... Actually, we'll just stick with that story where rhino in South Africa are increasingly supplying their jewelry trade, marking a shift away from cells to tra traditional medicine makers. Now, according to a new report uh, published on Monday, conservation group traffic say Chinese gangs were processing horns into beads, bracelets, and uh, bangles to supply Asia's booming uh, luxury goods market while also helping traffickers evade detection at airports. Julian Rademea, project director traffic, said that the market for horn uh, from the endangered species had uh, been transformed in recent years. Well, the assault on wildlife is extraordinary. Um, and, you know, over the last decade, we've seen over 7,100 rhinos killed by poachers. Um, keep in mind that 25,000 rhinos remain in Africa. South Africa is the center of the storm, home to 79% of Africa's last remaining rhinos, 91% uh, of poaching in 2016 taking place there. This is something that we haven't really seen before. And it touches on parallels in the ivory trade where people are manufacturing ivory products and then smuggling them out. And it raises a host of concerns. You know, the, we, we need to know a lot more about the scale of this activity, but it also raises concerns about the, uh, on a law enforcement basis. You know, law enforcement agencies are already under-resourced and overstretched. At the moment, most law enforcement agencies are looking for whole horns, they're looking for pieces of horn, but they're not looking for these smaller um, items that are being smuggled out. Well, and that report from South Africa takes us to a very short break. But when we come back, we'll have a conversation tonight which has everything to do with the entertainment industry in Africa. And with me tonight in studio, I have our guest composed of Ken Waundo, who, Waudo, who is uh, from the church and laugh industry. And then we have Dana Seda, who is a musician, as well as Marek Fuchs, who is the MD of Saudi Soul Entertainment. We'll have that conversation right here on Bottom Line Africa on KTN News after this very short break. Don't go too far. We'll be right back. Thank you.